edition of Sales TV, uh, the, the Emir edition, though we appreciate anyone around the world can be watching at any point in time. Welcome back to Cranfield University. Welcome back to the Grenfield Turner Studios. Uh, and thanks to our hosts and our team here, Chris, Toby, and everybody behind the scenes who makes this feel possible. Uh, we were just chatting a minute ago. Uh, if you look Indeed. back at this, <laughs> I'm joined by Adam, Adam Gray. Thank um, you. My first time in the studio, as it happens. But first time, the yeah. comment was that obviously you put on a few pounds on camera. The question is, is how many cameras does Chris have on me right now? Uh, more than I want, <laughs> looking at, oh, there, there. Uh, we've got a really interesting show for you today. Uh, we're going to talk about neurodiversity, and we have a fascinating guest who I've known for a few years, Dr. Rebecca Jackson. Uh, but we're also joined by Alex Abbott. Hi, Alex. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Looking Good forward morning. to this show. Good morning to you, Becky. How are you? having me on and uh, yeah i hope you're all well as well so uh, uh, not throwing you a deep end about this but i know that you've not you've not been in the country recently you've been somewhere else do you want to do you want to tell us where you were yeah i uh, recently trekked to everest base camp for my sins so yeah i've not long got back from nepal actually yeah oh, and what was that like Oh, that was amazing. It really is like being on another planet. It looks like the moon up there. It's seriously, it's out of this world. I'm so it was hard, but I'm so glad I did it. it, it it's it's interesting. So it, it's something that I've always wanted to do, you know, trek to Everest Base Camp. But uh, I am guess that from what you've just said, Base Camp isn't in fact base, is it? It's not like you rock up in a tour bus and you're there. Um, so so how, how, how hard a place is it to get to? Uh, so we trekked for eight days to get there over some quite difficult <laughs> terrain. I may have scooted on my bottom across a rock fall um, and had to uh, avoid uh, various uh, obstacles like that. So, yeah, it's it's not easy, but it is doable. Um, and if I can get up there, then anybody can get up there with a little bit of training and preparation. So it is doable. Uh, and what 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 motivated you to do it? Because I I'm going to be honest, I've always mm -hmm. wanted to do that, but I always chicken out at the last minute. What what, yeah. what what made you do it? Well, there there were two things really. One is that I desperately wanted to see Mount Everest with my own eyes and and look at the you know the ice fall and have that experience. But the other thing is as well because I'm a, a coach and I help people, uh, neurodivergent people, to do hard things or to to achieve complex goals. I wanted to be able to show that that I could do that as a neurodivergent person and share how I went about doing that. So that was also a big driver for me, Andy. I mean, hat off. I mean, I, I, I really admire that. And yeah, what we don't want to do in this conversation, we were talking about it, is, is dive straight into a conversation about neurodiversity and have everyone go, can you help me what? understand? Yeah, that? That, that was a really interesting thing that you said about the first question that we should ask you should be, can you explain what neurodiversity is? Because everybody has an idea of it. But it may be that, that, you know, we're not exactly on the same song sheet with this. So that, that was a fantastic yeah. point that you made, Andy. So can, can you lay out ex actually what is neurodiversity so that laymen and women like us can, can, can really understand it? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I think um, when it comes to neurodiversity, um, then that refers to the kind of the whole range of brains that exist uh, within humanity. And uh, when we're talking about neurodivergence, the way that individual people might differ from like the most common type of brain, um, we might see that people who are neurodivergent have different ways of learning or communicating or experiencing and interacting with the world. And that will be down to maybe how their brain is wired or structured or the way it works. Um, but yeah, that, that's what neurodiversity is, the range of brains. And then neurodivergence is the way that an individual person's brain is and might differ from the most kind of common uh, type of brain and, and way of interacting with the world. I hope that helps. Very much so. Yeah, Very absolutely. Much so. so obviously we're sales TV, so we're going to put a, a bit of a lens on this around sales, if that's okay. Um, so so how, how do you think neurodiversity affects a salesperson? You know, I'm dyslexic. I'll lay that out there. Uh, I mm -hmm. always have been. When I was at school, tender 45 years ago, um, 
I don't think anyone really recognised dyslexia. Mm. Uh, in some mm-hmm. countries, uh, I know a great uh, colleague of uh, Professor Toby Thompson and I um, over in the supply chain, she's from Turkey, and she said that they still don't recognise you know, dyslexia is an issue in Turkey. Mm-hmm. So we, we live in a world where we're starting, I think, to scratch the surface. But how, how does it, you know, if you're neurodivert, how, does, how do you cope as a salesperson? What are the things that you are challenged by? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. So um, we can look at this in two ways. So the kind of sales environment or being a sales professional um, can come with a number of challenges for um, certain people with neurodivergent conditions. Um, and I'll come to some of those uh, in a sec. But also there may be something particular about aspects of sales that actually suit certain types of neurodivergent brains um, uh, as well. Um, in terms of challenges, um, I think, um, for example, I have ADHD um, and there does seem to be quite a few people with ADHD in sales uh, positions Um, and with ADHD we can often have um, challenges um, around things like time management, proactivity, organisation, kind of following up on things and and keeping track of things Um, and those are some particular challenges um, that can not only affect um, obviously how the person conducts their their sales role but can also affect um, their well-being and stress levels as well um, if they're not able to get or create support with that and um, so those would be some of the challenges um, in terms of ADHD and obviously with dyslexia there may be challenges around how instructions are given or information is presented and um, things like that but but really we can look at you know, what we can do to help and support certainly as leaders and educate people about how they can help themselves as well where it's appropriate. Becky, I've got a question for you if I jump mm. in there. I'm I'm a huge supporter of um, positive mental health in, in sales. Mm. And some of the things that you describe there, uh, you know, I think, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing that salespeople have these traits. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they're high, high performers in some cases, but in many cases, I can't help but feel that, um, you know, those salespeople that are perhaps learning at a slower pace than others mm-hmm. are then put under more stress and feel more pressure mm-hmm. and therefore it's affecting their mental health. So, you, you know, you mentioned about, um, uh, you know, providing things for salespeople to help themselves, but what responsibility should the employer have on on this yeah so i need to caveat this with kind of saying i'm not a hr expert but we know that organizations do have a legal and i think moral obligation and um, to to support their neurodivergent employees to carry out their work in a, a safe and comfortable um, and accessible way and you, you know alex the, the figures are horrific like i was looking at a study last week that said that 50 percent of neurodivergent people in the workplace currently believe they are at risk of an imminent burnout and about 70 percent um are um having a current mental health um challenge or an ongoing mental health challenge um and so i think um certainly sales leaders managers do have a responsibility legal and moral um to to take an honest kind of look at themselves and say okay is this something that i know enough about yes or no could i undertake some training and could i learn what people need and how to have discussions with people about what they need and the kind of tools and techniques and supports that I can put in place as a manager um, to to help them. And and I think it's worth saying that there is nothing that you could do to support a neurodivergent sales professional that wouldn't probably benefit other sales professionals as well. It's Um, really funny that you're saying that. Absolutely. Mm. Because as I was listening to you speak, I was thinking, uh, Andy, you you know, you are are forever bringing up uh, output from reports and and surveys that have been done about how, you know, this many people in sales are suffering from fear of burnout. This many people have got mental health challenges. This many people are feeling stressed. And I was thinking we're we're, we're talking about this or, or, or the initial start of the conversation was that this is a uniquely neurodiverse challenge. And it isn't. This is actually everybody in sales. And maybe the key to unlocking how we make sales a better place for people is to look at how we need to support neurodiverse people and how we can roll that out across the entire sales uh, world 
rather than just that particular pocket, because there, there will be learnings to be had, which I'm sure could be widely used here. I'd love it if you could yeah. share that that insight you mentioned earlier, the the fifty percent of uh, salespeople suffering with with stress, was it? Um, so so they consider themselves um, at, at risk of an imminent burnout. And okay. and actually, um, that is a really important thing to pick up on, be, because um, the thing is, is that um, you're right that everybody in a sales role, you know, we all work in that busy, dynamic, ever changing, ever chasing the number kind of environment. We all work within that space. But some people um, have the deck stacked against them um, mm. in terms of how they can cope. So this is about coping and then being able to thrive. And the thing is, is that if you don't have what you need as a neurodivergent sales professional to be able to cope and to be able to exec execute your sales role well, then you will put in more effort, more time, more bandwidth to try and keep up. And that is what leads to that increased risk of burnout. Yeah. And this is what I think needs to be talked about more. So sales leaders uh, uh, can understand it and then start to do something about it. So if, if you can share that insight with me after the show, I'd love to share it in our LinkedIn group. Well, Absolutely. Think, I'll pass that on. I think what it's, just, it's literally just just hit me <laughs> that the, when I started work, I was working in, in, in Barclays. It's now Barclays Asset Finance, long since gone. But, Becky, one of the things you had to do is you would go out and find a customer and you would mm. basically sell to that customer the concept mm. of them borrowing money against an asset that, that they wanted to buy. Call it a car, call it a printing press. Mm. There is a, re a reason behind this, so just bear, yeah. give me a little latitude. <laughs> But once you'd done that, you had to go and sell the risk to your underwriters. So you had to come back into the bank and justify why that was a good loan. You clearly have to present the accounts and all of the other things. And you had to write a lending report. And there was four of us in the office. And if you were good enough, over time, the manager who always had to countersign and had a, an authority up to a certain amount to approve before it went to an underwriter you got your own limit. So it, you didn't mm. have to go through the manager for 50,000 and below. And mm -hmm. I remember uh, he was my best man, really great guy. Um, he, he got his underwriting limit of, of 50,000. And I was told I didn't write good enough reports. <laughs> and it's only just hit me now. So actually, I, I, being a, I, I didn't have any support. There was no such thing as spell checker or any of the other things that are available today. Yeah. And I can remember going home and crying. I said to my mm. wife, why? And it's only just hit me now that I, I, it took me until actually she sat me down and said, this is how you write. And mm. I still suffer from that today. I, I can't, you mm. know, I can talk, but I, 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 I fear sticking anything down on paper because I just get all muddled up. And I yeah. find that really fascinating that we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. And if you talk about education today, which all people are, actually the scariest bit is GCSEs. There's no support mm. for neurodiversity at GCSE level. We're, we're fighting for one of our children to do that. But you come mm. to university and, and post-GCSE, A-level, degree, postgraduate, there's lots of support for them. It seems like universities like here just go, yeah, we get it. There's the speech recognition. There's all of these tools that help you. But that, that, that bit that gives you the gateway to anything is the hardest bit right now. Well, I, I think we see this played out so often, don't we? You know, you go to school as an education, as an example, and the first thing they should teach you is how to learn, and they don't. Like, yeah. you should be taught how to sell, and you're told, Andy, just go out and sell something, right, you know, just, it, yeah. just go and chat. But we've got a really interesting comment here from uh, Dr. Dale Childs. Uh, so he said... Uh, I wonder what are the key things that managers can do to help these salespeople manage this? Uh, what have you found to be most useful, Becky? Hmm. Yeah, so um, I can talk about the job role and I can talk about the on the job learning as well. Um, and so that, you know, people have the same equity of opportunity in, in kind of progressing uh, their career. So let's think about how we can support them in the role. Um, first of all, well, obviously, that's going to uh, 
that's going to depend on their particular flavor of neurodivergence. And so what I would say um, is that um, obviously um, you can ask people if there's been a disclosure, it's okay um, to, to kind of ask people what they might need and also to get help from HR or occupational health if, if you have that stuff in your organization um, to go to. But if it is around stuff uh, to do with how do I execute like the practical stuff and the organizing stuff and the stuff that might not be as interesting and engaging as talking to the customer, then um, what, what I say to a lot of sales leaders is when you're working and with and coaching these people, it's not about training them on how to sell necessarily. Um, in fact, they might be quite good at some aspects of influencing and, and selling already. Um, but it's about helping people to access um, training or providing workplace adjustments that actually allow them to, um, to do the bits of the role that they find more stressful and challenging. So if we take Andy's case, you know, today, if Andy, you were doing those underwriting reports, you'd have access to even free dictation stuff on your phone like otter yeah. that could just transcribe things for you um you know there, there's a whole bunch of stuff things like asana and pipe drive you know various crm or task management things that can not only help you to capture what you're supposed to be doing but also flag up to you if you've got a deadline coming or if you've got an action to complete so i do think yeah we've not even plumbed the depths of what you know practical tools or ai can do but but at the same time if somebody works best on a piece of paper because that's what they can see and understand then the technology you need to encourage them to use is a piece of paper so it really yeah. depends on them but, but okay, yeah. it's, it's this i think there's this undervalued term that's used called psychological safety you know mm. sales leaders talk about it but do they actually provide that so that mm. salespeople can feel uh safe enough to say do you know what i'm really struggling with this report i'm really struggling with writing this rfp this 50 page you know rfp um request for proposal um, mm. So what, you know, what, and I know Andy's talked about this before in previous episodes, but what is, you know, what is psychological safety and how would, mm. how would a, a leader, a business go about creating that for their salespeople? Yeah, so psychological safety really just just broadly put is kind of setting up the organiza organizational culture and the individual interactions that you have with your sales professionals so that they feel um, that they are able to disclose things or discuss things, um, say, to do with their neurodivergence and their needs. And of course, we can imagine that, you know, high trust um, would be a crucial component in, in helping that to, ha to happen. Um, but in in terms of like practical things, there's two ingredients that I think is super important. One is um, disclosure from leadership, um, as long as it's safe and comfortable to, to do so. So I encounter um, sales leaders who are in their you know 50s and 60s who know they are dyslexic or know they have ADHD, but they're frightened to say they haven't told anybody. However, if I was 23 and just come into sales and I'm struggling, if I saw my big boss that I admire being open about uh, their struggles and challenges and, and strengths, that would encourage me to do the same. So that is one thing. Um, but the other one, I think, is having a coaching culture, mm -hmm. having a, a culture where it is normal and expected for people to take time away from the kind of busy humdrum of the sales environment to actually reflect on what their goals and desires are in their role and what they need to be able to get there. So I think those two things are really helpful in promoting that psychological safety and, and getting the topic out there in the open uh, for people to feel like it's normal to talk about. Do you, I mean, this is a question for every for, for everyone. I'd love to get Andy and Adam's thoughts, but should, do, do you think it's okay for the sales leader that is uh, uh, cracking the whip from a forecasting perspective to also be the coach? It's a great question, actually. Mm. How, how do you do uh, And I just want to add for, but give Becky some time to answer that. Uh, a great friend of mine, I really admire him, Paul Devlin. He, he's now uh, a, a company 
he did something in a previous organization, very big technology company, where he said to his leaders and managers, no one gets a bonus unless everybody hits 100%. And, and actually to achieve that, your mechanism is coaching. Yeah. And what he found is... So my, point, my, my bonus yeah. is absolutely reliant on you achieving your number, yeah. not just me achieving... I mean, yeah. that's a fantastic way to build a team, isn't it? But, but what he found is it takes six coaching interventions for you to believe that it's not going to come around about the number. So this is not a forecast inspection. It's not a deal inspection. It's about you, Adam. And, and so actually, uh, you're going to be looking at me six times, six months, and you're going to, at some point, Andy, you're going, to, you're going to go back to normal and go, well, where's the deal? Now, he managed to change that, and the individual stuck on the journey. But, but Becky, I'd love now to hear your answer. Now, I've, I've, I've given you a little bit of breathing space to think <laughs> about that, because it is a, it's a bit of a sticky conversation, that one. Yeah, um, so so there's two things I'd like to say. I think um, uh, in, interesting to just throw in about that that kind of way of structuring the incentives. Um, that could be really motivating for some people, but it could be terrifying okay, sure. um, for, for neurodivergent people um, who perhaps would worry that they would not be able to keep up and they might let their team members down. Um, and so when we're thinking about incentivization, it can be worth looking at is this going to lead to you know increased stress or, or burnout for anybody in the team um, due to their ability to to kind of deliver on that but um, in terms of um, or what what was the other thing that we were um, talking about before then sorry coaches and whether the manager can yes. actually coach or should should they be doing the same thing yeah, so it's perfectly possible and indeed can be highly effective for a manager um, to take a coaching approach to dealing with the numbers, the forecast, the pipeline, things like that. But I think what's really important is contracting and signposting. Um, and, and that can look like saying, here's what this conversation is about and here's what hat I'm wearing today with you. Um, and then, you know, at different times um, saying, OK, today it's training or today it's mental mentoring so kind of being really explicit about um about what you're talking about and what kind of hat you're wearing um that deals with any ethical issues around that you know cracking the whip and coaching um, but also it makes it very clear to um, a range of brains what's happening and why so that they can understand and engage with it safely have that psychological safety so it can be done but just signpost what's going on and why so i think let, let's let's be slightly controversial. Um, mm -hmm. It appears Unlike a bit. You. It's a bit. It appears a bit hard. So if I'm a sales leader, it's a lot easier to try and skew my interviewing to people who aren't dyslexic, aren't neurodivergent, and go for the standard superstar. What? Why is that a bad decision? Because I think it is. But I, why is that a bad decision? So are you saying, Andy, like as the coach, it's it's easier to just, you know, pick your uh, top former or pick someone who's coachable or pick someone who doesn't have any, you know, neuro, neurodivergent challenges, maybe go for the, the low hang, hanging fruit? Uh, in the interview processes, we've all talked about the bias, et cetera, of you know, inclusivity mm -hmm. and there's this bias around gender and, and, and origination mm -hmm. and all of these things. And mm -hmm. I have my view, which I'll come on to in a minute from some early work we did very, very mm -hmm. early in the institution. But it's probably, isn't it, isn't it just easier to try to screen these people out in the interview process and not have them in your sales force and just not have the problem? Well, be before you answer that, Becky, I would like yeah. to say that if, every time I come on uh, a video podcast, whichever one it is, and we're having this conversation, I have, like you said, ah, oh, it's just dawned on me now why this was every time. Uh, I find exactly that. I, I find that aha moment going on. And I think what's really interesting for me, Becky, is that when you introduced this, you said about uh, neurodiversity, a whole range of mm. brains from you know mm. one extreme to the other. And mm. I think that uh, a lot of people, to use the words that you used, Andy, it's like, okay, so we've got like like this, the, the, we're going to go after this kind of, and I'm going to screen my interviewing process in order that I get just this kind of person or my coaching techniques for just this kind of person. And actually the reality is that uh, neurodiversity is far more obvious to people now because it is being diagnosed and being identified in all of its different forms. Mm. And we realize that 
is it actually, is that the minority or is everybody, do they all have a, a, a level of neurodiversity? And therefore, these lessons about how you, you are at the cutting edge of this and how you are creating safe spaces and support and uh, methodologies and, and tricks and tips that people can use to overcome their own personal challenges, this is crucial for empowering not just neurodiverse people, not just salespeople, but everybody in the workplace and everybody in the human race, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So I, I think to respond uh, quickly uh, to, to your point before we talk about kind of interviews and, and, and recruitment, Adam, um, I, I think I agree with you. But what it's really important to stress is while there would be probably benefits for, for everybody, and I think there's a lot of useful stuff that would make the, the kind of sales workplace better for all, um, the key point not to lose is that the neurodivergent employ, employees must have those things it's not a nice yeah. to have and so you would be failing on that legal and moral requirement if those things um weren't weren't there um to to come to the um interviewing stuff um obviously uh, i know i know you were being controversial andy uh, but but obviously it would be um illegal uh, to screen people out on the basis of of their brain in in almost all cases um and actually there's been some really big um employment tribunals recently Recently, uh, where psychometric testing or particular types of interview have been found to be discriminatory against people, um, and that led to, to big big payouts. Um, I always hated one thing... them. Oh, go on. I always hated them, Becky. Those psychometric tests. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah the, it, it can really, you, you know, you run the risk of actually screening somebody out as well who could have fantastic strengths mm. and unique perspectives to, to bring yeah. to the role. But but one thing we can do that, that um, meets that requirement of helping the people who have to have it, but also benefiting others, sounds controversial, but just send your interview questions out in advance, let everybody see them. Um, you, you know, because you get a better quality of answer from everybody, but then you're not discriminating against um, your neurodivergent employees who need time to process or need time to know what is going to happen in the interview. Um, but, but yeah, you really do run the risk of screening out some great contributions as well. You know, Becky, we... Sorry, go on, Andy. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, 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 so what, what I was actually going to do was actually offer... The, the, the reason I was kind of being kind of controversial is uh, the very inset of, of what is now the ISP. We actually created a study with a global top four uh, consultancy to, to actually measure the impact of inclusivity and diversity. Uh, and I think, I will say, I don't like diversity and inclusivity. I think the world's got it the wrong way around. You have to be mm -hmm. inclusive before you can be diverse. Agree. But, but yeah. back to that point, um, Actually, that inclusive and diverse teams by ethnic origin, gender, orientation, and, and mental capability were proved at that point some nine years ago to be 7% more profitable than those teams that weren't. Mm. So it's not only avoiding the illegal elements of this process, it's actually the mm. actual argument is it's bloody common sense it's good for business it's business yeah. sense and and if and, and if it's so prevalent in society don't we want to have those inclusive and diverse teams that are going to meet the same kind of things on the buying side and because it's a human yeah. science mm. why are we thinking that we you know it, it's not representative of society so so the reason I actually asked that question is mm. I, th I think everybody should be exploring this. Mm. And I think mm. it answers one of the issues, which is if we're short of salespeople, we're short of talented salespeople. That's the argument. There might be less open mm. vacancies. Um, I don't know if you saw the figures this morning or heard the figures um, on the BBC. So kind of trusted source. There is actually currently today just short of 998 thousand vacancies in the uk and this is the first time that wages have increased more than inflation so you're starting to see things change in the labor market and there was forty-three thousand vacancies filled in the last three months so there's mm. still a lot of vacancies out there mm. and it might well be that people are saying i will release i will release rightly or wrongly my underperformers and I'll pause on investment in some of those roles 
However, we see that older salespeople are retiring, going for fractional jobs, consultancy jobs, mm. moving away. We see younger people not wanting to come into it more. Mm. Surely we should be actually opening the doors and saying, let's be very, very inclusive and diverse. And that is all ranges of diversity because that's going to make mm. great business sense and it's going to represent society. And it's going to give us a different type of culture that people can feel psychologically brilliantly safe. But, but also within the sales environment, it's all about the bottom line. 7%. A 7% competitive advantage by behaving this way. Because not only is it morally right, not only is it legally right, it's also, from a business perspective, yep. the right thing to do by your shareholders. I mean, it, it should be a no-brainer, shouldn't it? Yeah, but Adam, how many sales leaders really uh, think about neurodivergence when, they, when they're thinking about uh, you know, neuro, uh, inclusion and diversity? I, 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 don't, I don't think many do. I might be wrong. Well, I think Becky, I'm answering your question here, I think Becky covered it a little bit earlier, which is actually, it's back to the psychological safety of the leader. And leaders don't feel mm -hmm. psychologically safe to be vulnerable. And consequently, they then can't actually go to their organisations and say, there's a different way of doing things here. Uh, I, I don't feel safe suggesting it, I'm going to get shot down. You know, people are going, I don't care mm -hmm. about that, Adam, just get on with the numbers. It's not for you to think about these mm -hmm. things, it's just for you to get, to, do. to think about the number. Yeah. And there's a great, uh, a really good friend of mine called Chris Payton. He's, a, he's an ex-lieutenant, well, he's a retired lieutenant colonel, and, and he helps boards now tackle some of these really, really interesting issues. But what he looks at is actually the military have become, in leadership, hugely vulnerable, which you wouldn't expect of military people in the armed mm. forces. You'd expect to like, charge that hill, <laughs> we're done, it's all about male machoism. Um, and, and he said, no, it doesn't work anymore. Actually, you've got to realize your own, you know, as a, as a general, if you're going to get a division to follow you, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be real. You've got to remain your own fellow bits. And I said, well, surely that, that works in corporate world. Yeah? Surely that works in the sales world. He went, no. He said, because there's still that perception of I'm paid the big bucks to know all the answers. Therefore, I've got to, be, I've got to know all the answers. Regardless of what question it is, I've got the answer. Mm. And it's that back to psychological safety of the leader being vulnerable as a leader and being authentic, and then it will flow down. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. No, um, absolutely. So, so we've we've got some uh, some questions that we we prepped for you actually, Becky, and uh, yeah. a, couple, a couple of these are just uh, I'm, I, I would love to know. So, uh, uh, how can neurodivergent people support themselves? You know, I'm neurodivergent. Mm. I've gone into a role. What should I be doing in terms of support, or what help should I be asking for from the team, the leadership, the organisation, um, in order that I can, I can be my best self and I can feel that I'm really a, a contributor to the team. Yeah. So let's carve this up by people who kind of know some stuff mm. already and people who don't. So what often happens, particularly with women as well. So let's, you know, let's think about, um, you know, the role of women in, in sales. Um, like myself, I was only diagnosed as ADHD and autistic in my late 30s. And, um, and I didn't actually know what would help me. And so if you find yourself in that position, if you're newly diagnosed and it's at a later uh, time in in life then actually you could do things like approach hr you could talk to occupational health and there's also the government's access to work scheme where you can get an assessment you don't even need a formal diagnosis actually but you can get an assessment um, to find out what some of your needs are and they will um, pay um, along with your employer depending on the size of the organization they will pay for things like um, coaching or devices or software that can help you so that's a place to start if you really don't don't know um, but are there some tools I could give you well let's think about that overwhelm and that burnout so um, I would urge you to look for practical tools that meet challenges so if you need to find dictation software or diaries and alarms that you're actually going to understand and pay attention to experiment with what is out there and find that software or use that AI um, that is going to help you but that's practical stuff that doesn't help you manage this it doesn't help you manage yourself um, and and so um, looking after your mental health looking after your general well-being is going to be so important and that might be 
talking about things in in coaching or seeking external mental health support if you need it but it's also about keeping kind of calm in the workplace and and keeping some work-life balance as well so it might be you know popping a few more breaks in the schedule um, getting outside doing coaching with your manager outside or in a different place um, anything that puts that kind of pause in where your body and your mind can just chill out for a few minutes and step away from the craziness all of that that can help you uh, to support yourself for mm. sure well, we've had some, sorry, Alex, we've had some fantastic uh, comments of support for this and, and everyone in the audience seems to be loving this. You know, thank you so much. Uh, we really needed to have this conversation. Uh, I've got a really interesting comment here from Andrew Slesser. Uh, if leaders do not think that being inclusive and diverse with their work, sorry, do not think uh, being inclusive, diverse with their work, the pool of selection of the next generation workforce will be dramatically reduced which obviously is, is uh, well, it's common sense really, isn't it? Uh, mm. But uh, from LinkedIn user, and I can't see who this is because of how their security settings are, they've said the following, it has been reported that adults with ADHD are around 60% more likely to be fired, 30% more likely to have ongoing chronic uh, employment issues, and three times more likely to quit on impulse. I mean, that's I find, that's truly shocking, find, isn't it? I find that astonishing. And to I think you know the question you asked uh, Becky earlier, Adam, what tools can uh, are available to people um, that are neurodivergent to help them? But what about those people that don't yet know? Yeah, oh, it's it's, yeah. A diff it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because in reality, again, the aha moment. Some, some you've just read out. Uh, uh, on a, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know me. I'm an impulse guy. Yeah. And occasionally, I will go right. That's it. I'm off. It's I'm done. Yeah. And it's actually again in this conversation. It's like a therapy session with all these people. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll go cry in a minute. And have a hug. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that, but but that is true. I mean, I'm really laying myself out in terms of yeah. I recognise that in me. If it gets really bloody hard even in some of the roles I volunteer in, it's like, yeah, everything gets thrown in the air and it's that blip. Then about an hour and a half later on reflection, I'll go, well, maybe, maybe I overreacted a bit there and it's, it doesn't help. Uh, but mm. yeah, it's, and, and therefore you need to know around this thing. Isn't it? If you're a leader and you see a salesperson do that, how do you give them some tolerance to go, let's go and have a coffee and chat and walk outside and, and, and walk and talk and then let's reassess as to, it's probably not a decision mm. you want to take and we can help you more. Well, I, yeah. I think it, it's it's really interesting that uh, for me this this is an education issue. You know, we each pick up little snippets of what neurodiversity is, like all of the other things that we come into in in the workplace, and we jump to all sorts of conclusions from the little snippets that we've picked up. And I, I want to come back again to the very first thing that you said, Becky, which was uh, neurodiversity is a range, mm. and that's the mm. point. You know, the point is that there are people that have uh, complex needs as a result of that and they find things a real challenge and they obviously need supporting but we can all see elements of ourselves in all of these behaviors normally mm -hmm. and i think that that recognizing that it's not it's not a problem that you have although you may have that problem more than me i mean use the word problem in inverted commas this is something that we all have you know the stress in sales is not something which is unique it may be exacerbated by having neurodiversity and overwhelm and, and burnout but, but these are global lessons. And we see that in your comment about the performance of organizations. You know, a, a diverse workforce in all of its different aspects, 7% higher performing. Mm. I mean, this is obvious, isn't it? it? It's really interesting because um, in, in, in Toby, who runs the Gre you know, Grenfell Studios here, uh, it, you know, centers on uh, executive development. It'd be really good to get him on, actually, and talk about what trends he sees, particularly in sales organizations, because again, another ha ha moment. A sales leader will go, Well, I'll try and find something for my sales managers to develop on and, and, and courses and training for them to go on. And we all know that there's the avalanche downhill to sales, sales people get X amount of training to fix normally a corporate problem. But actually, how many senior C suite leaders go, Where's my development? Where's, where do I go off to? and yeah. enhance and develop my skills because I, I managed before the pandemic and I thought I knew what the world was. Now I've been through this pandemic and whatnot. And, and I think that answer, I'd love to get Toby's insights on that. And I think that answer is probably down towards zero. 
Yeah, mm. I get emerging people will go through MBAs and do various things like that. But actually, when does the C-suite person go away and go, I want to talk to other C-suites and figure out, they might have a coach themselves, but actually, when when's their space to go and look inside creating mm. psychological safety? So yeah. we, we've had a, we've had another great comment from Jess Flack here, which is, don't forget that there are neuro neurodivergent superpowers, ways of working that are incredibly impactful. And I, I, I think again, you know, nowadays in the modern world, the leaders need to be able to identify those superpowers and promote them and embrace those, rather than trying to force people into a box. You know, that well, that's just the way it is. And you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it is about learning these new techniques of managing and getting the best from people. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I was back here. You know, give you two seconds to thought, but but I was yeah. told that I scared the living bejesus out of most people because they went because your your brain works in such a way you see things mm -hmm. and the connections of what is possible mm -hmm. far quicker than anybody else does. So everyone else sits in the room and goes, "Where's he going?" What, 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 what's mm. he just said? And I've got no idea how we're going to get there. Mm. Be Becky, what are your thoughts around that? The superpowers? And yeah, so the super the superpowers kind of framing of, of stuff is an interesting one. And I think in terms of the psychological safety and in terms of kind of people feeling, feeling comfortable to talk about their own neurodivergency, it's important to consider that some neurodivergent people feel very strongly that they have some enhanced abilities, but some people um, actually are quite turned off um, by the, the superpower kind of um, narrative. And, and some people will even say, I'm, I might be autistic, but I actually don't have any special powers, quote unquote. I can't, you know, count cards in a casino or, or anything like that. And they find that unhelpful and, and find it something they can't live up to or don't identify with. Right. But they, but it is certainly fair to say, um, it is certainly fair to say that there are some unique strengths that that or perspectives that may be associated um, with neurodivergence. And we do see, I think we do see that in in sales. You know, if you think about um, what um, selling is it's about building a relationship with someone helping them collaboratively to solve their problems coming up with those ideas like you described Andy in the moment that nobody else is going to offer surely if you could have somebody if you could recruit someone who could deliver that all the time or most of the time without burning out obviously um, then then you would you would want that and um, and so I think as long as it's a, a helpful way of framing it for those um, those people in your team that are neurodivergent then certainly there are really unique strengths um, that these people can bring to sales and probably is what attracts them to sales in the first place so yeah. we need to keep yeah. them yeah, yeah, yeah really before point. before the before the show Becky we spoke and um, uh, you know I use the term I think the spectrum and you quite quickly mm. corrected me that there is there is no don't think of this as a as being somewhere on a spectrum think about you know it more in a black and white sense you either are or, or you aren't but what advice can you give sales leaders that perhaps need to get a view of uh, where their sales people sit and then how they <laughs> should uh, react or support them effectively yeah, I, I think I think that's really important. And it speaks to that question you had earlier about what if you don't know or what if nobody knows that, that you're neurodivergent. So I do think it's important to stay within our lane um, from from a kind of HR perspective, as well as from a personal comfort perspective. Um, and, and so, you know, we can't you know, whether it's as a sales leader or a sales coach, we can't go around diagnosing people. We're not clinicians um, and we are not, you know, uh, we are not educational um, psychologists. And 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 so um, I do think it's important about using other channels or support. So, you know, again, HR, occupational health, also maybe doing a kind of uh, mental health first aid course. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously as part of mental health, 
um, first aid training, one of the things you learn is to kind of refer people to internal and external supports. And if somebody is struggling as a result of their neurodivergence, um, one of the first indicators that they or anybody else may notice, this is what happened to me, it's how I got diagnosed, is they will experience a burnout or some form of really poor mental health, uh, like depression or anxiety. And so even if you don't know or they don't know whether that has been triggered by unmet needs from neurodivergence, you would still advise them to, you know, see occupational health and go to the GP. And, and, and so just taking that general caring approach and referring on to other supports is, is what you would do. And then with luck, because things are improving, but with luck, somebody will eventually say to them, and I and this needs to happen more often, but someone will eventually say, have you considered that you might be autistic or have you considered that you might have ADHD? Let's look at that. And then somebody else will carry that for you um, to make That's it funny. easier on you. Yeah. Becky, uh, we're unfortunately at time. I think we could go another hour on this. Yeah. I was just thinking what a <laughs> thrilling show it this has been. been. Yeah, Absolutely great. fantastic. So, Becky, thank you so much for coming on. on you're so welcome. Thank you. Brilliant. Alex, thank you. You're um, Adam, it's been great to be on the sofa. Your, your, you know, your, your sofa duck has now been broken. Indeed it has. Thank um, you. Thank you to, to Chris, Toby, um, David, and the entire team here. Um, we are learning. We hope you love the style of what's going on uh, here. Please give us your thoughts about what you want to see going forward from Sales TV. Uh, so thank you to, to Cranfield again for hosting us and the Grenville Turner Studios. And we wish you, wherever you are, a great end to your day, start to your day, or, or you know, halfway through your day. Thanks for watching. Have a great thank day. You. Thanks for having me.